Chapter 4, Medical, Legal, and Ethical Issues. Some of the things we'll be discussing today are scope of practice, patient consent, and as patient consent relates to refusal as well, and some other miscellaneous legal issues. Scope of practice. This defines the extent and limits of an EMT's job. Scope of practice includes regulations and ethical considerations that defines the scope or extent or limits of an EMT's job, and it also may include skills and procedures determined by national, state, local, local laws, statutes, and protocols. Standard of care is care that would be expected from an EMT with similar training when caring for a patient in a similar situation. This is kind of the threshold that we use when we talk about patient care and how we treat and how we develop protocols. Uh, that's also why we have um, quality assurance coordinators and things like that in our system and across DMS to make sure that every person is getting the same type of care for the same type of problems. Standard of care also talks about meeting standard of care um, and reduces risk of legal action. So again, if everybody that has chest pain or breathing difficulty is treated the same way, regardless of sex, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, anything like that, uh, then it really reduces the risk that uh, anything of legal action may come out of it. Scope of practice talks about what you can do, whereas standard of care talks about how you should do it. Let's talk about patient consent and refusal. Remember that a patient must give consent to treat to the, to the EMT that's on scene. This consent may be expressed or implied, and we'll talk about that here shortly. Consent is permission from a patient to assess, treat, and transport. So express consent is talking about they must be informed, and implied consent is assumed consent. So in this case, you would follow all local laws and protocols. So express consent means that they're conscious, they're alert, they called for help or somebody else called for help for them, and when you arrive on scene, you talk to them and you ask if you can assess them, treat them, and transport them. It may be all three or it may be just assessing them and then they end up signing a refusal. Um, but they have to know the risks of accepting treatment and they also need to know the risks of denying or declining treatment. Implied consent is basically when someone is unconscious or uh, they are under the uh, age limit for being a consenting adult. Children and mentally incompetent adults, um, talk, talking about consent, minors are not legally able to permit, uh, permitted to provide consent or refusal for treatment. Uh, so anybody under the age of 18 cannot uh, accept or deny treatment on their own. In order to do so, you must obtain this from a parent or legal guardian. Some of the possible exceptions, and you'll see this in your book too, is in loco parentis and emancipated minors. Uh, if you're dealing with an emancipated minor, you will know very quickly um, because they will have documentation to show that they are indeed an emancipated minor uh, so they can make decisions on their own. Possible exceptions you may think of and may look at, um, depending on your local laws, life-threatening illnesses or injuries, uh, minors who have children, and minors serving in the armed forces. Uh, in most cases, minors that have children, um, they can make decisions for their kids, um, but they cannot make decisions for themselves uh, once the child is born. Adult patients that are incapable of informed decisions about care, again, follow your state local uh, laws and protocols um, as how they relate and permit transport of such patients under the implied consent clause. Involuntary transportation, the patient's considered a threat to himself or others. If they've made suicidal or homicidal comments, um, we can transport them involuntarily. If they have a court order, uh, we can transport them involuntarily. Typically, these uh, involuntary transportations require decisions by a mental health professional or um, law enforcement. If a patient's restrained, uh, you must not risk legal liability. If a patient's also restrained, it's important that uh, if they're restra restrained by law enforcement, you have to make sure that either they're going to um, take off those restraints prior to transport, or if indeed they have to remain uh, restrained, uh, law enforcement has to ride with you to the hospital.
Let's take a moment and talk about what happens when a patient refuses care. Um, the biggest thing about patient refusals is this accounts for a huge percentage of EMS-related lawsuits. Remember that EMTs are responsible to attempt to persuade uh, each and every patient, uh, but usually don't have the right to force the issue. Uh, so under, under the patient uh, refusing care, they can refuse care or transport under the following circumstances. Um, they have to be legally able to consent. They have to be awake and oriented. They must be fully informed of the risks kind of like what we talked about with express consent. They have to know that if they refuse treatment, what could happen, and also what could happen if they accept treatment. And they're going to be asked to sign a release form, or in most cases, they're called refusal forms. Um, despite any precaution that we may take, we still may be held liable. We need to make sure that we're taking all possible actions to try to persuade the patient to accept care and transport. Spend a good amount of time speaking with the patient, Listen carefully to try to determine why the patient is refusing care. Is this an issue about money? Is this an issue about leaving their home? Um, you know, are they independent? They live by themselves, and they feel that if they go to the hospital, they may not make it back home. Do they have pets or something like that at home that they care for? That they're worried if they go to the hospital, the pets won't be cared for. Uh, inform the patient the consequences of not going to the hospital. You know, respiratory problems, heart problems. Um, and even on the refusals, we talk about um, no matter how minor or significant the injury or illness may be, you know, the ultimate consequence could be death. Um, and they need to know that should they not accept treatment and transport, ultimately whatever they called us for today or somebody else called us for, it could result in death. Typically what I like to do when I spend time with patients is I usually try to ask them at least three times whether or not they want to go to the hospital. You know, kind of at the beginning when you realize what's going on, that they need treated. Hey, I think this is a good idea you get treated. I think this may be a cardiac issue. I think you should go to the hospital. Maybe they say no. So then I start working on um, finding out why they don't want to go to the hospital. Try to figure out if there's a reason that I can persuade them into going to the hospital. If they still insist, um, you know, I say okay. And then start working on the refusal form. There's lots of things you have to document on the refusal form. Uh, vital signs, including their blood pressure, their pulse, their respiratory rate, their oxygen saturation, um, and personal information on their refusal form as well. And then before I have them sign the refusal form, I inform them, hey, it's still not too late. If you want to go to the hospital, we can still um, take you to the hospital if you want to. And if they still decline, then I offer them to take or I uh, have them sign the refusal form, and then we go on from there. It's also important to note that uh, just because they sign a refusal form doesn't mean that they can't seek transport or care later. Just let them know that this is for this specific instance right here and right now. In 10 minutes, if you decide that the pain is getting worse or the breathing problems are getting worse or whatever else is going on and you feel like you need to go to the hospital at that time, call us back. We will come out and we will take you to the hospital. Again, take all possible actions to persuade the patient to accept care and transport. Um, in some cases, you may need to contact medical control. Um, there's many cases that medical control still can't force the patient to come in um, against their will, um, but contact medical control. And uh, sometimes if you really think they need to go in, medical control may also advise, hey, we really feel like this patient needs to be seen. It may help reinforce a decision that they may persuade them to get seen. Uh, if indeed they are going to seek a refusal, ask the patient if it's okay if you call a family member or a friend um, and advise the patient that you would like to call um, a family member or a friend. Um, sometimes a family member or friend will help persuade them to go. Um, if not, they may at least come over and stay with them and monitor them and see if their condition worsens or gets better. Call law enforcement personnel if necessary. Um, if you feel that they're a harm to themselves, or others and they won't go willingly, um, or you really feel like they don't have the capacity to make their own decisions and they still refuse to go, uh, you may need to get PD involved and have them uh, assist in that uh, transport. So think about the risk. What's the risk of beginning treatment or transport without getting consent from the patient? Really what we're looking at here is you could be uh, charged with battery if, you, uh, if the patient really wanted to press charges and was adamant about not being uh, assess, treated, or transported. Um, you can also be charged with such things as uh, fra false imprisonment, kidnapping, um, things like that if they really wanted to push the issue and you force them to go against their will. 
um, and you didn't have the legal justification to do so. Uh, what about if the patient refuses to sign the refusal of care form? It's a common thing, especially if they didn't call themselves um, or they're uh, you know in a state of mind where uh, they're really upset or aggravated. They may refuse to uh, ref they may refuse to sign the refusal form. Um, in such cases, have somebody witness. Um, and in a lot of refusal forms, there's actually a, a explanation area that says uh, that you can fill in that says why uh, they refuse to sign the refusal. Remember that subjecting the patient to unwanted care and transport has actually been viewed to the court as assault and battery. Uh, have witnesses to the refusal. Uh, you really should avoid having uh, your partner uh, witness the refusal form. You should have somebody like a, a friend of the patient or a family member of the patient. Uh, it kind of gives a little bit more liability um, to them. And a lot of times if uh, the, the friend or family member signs it, they feel a little bit more responsible and they may try to persuade them to go. Uh, and like I said a couple slides ago, inform the patient that if they change their mind, they can always call back. That refusal form is just here and now. Right now you don't want to go, but if you change your mind, please call. We will take you back. Again, if possible, have the friend or relative remain with the patient. Make sure they can observe them. Um, especially for such things, one of the most common refusals that we do are, are what we call diabetic wake-ups, where uh, somebody's blood sugar got too low. Um, we get on scene, they're unconscious or very confused. Uh, we administer some sugar and they wake up, they're oriented, they're fine, they don't want to go. Uh, those are very common refusals that we do uh, very often. Uh, but make sure that you document all of these attempts very thoroughly that you offered three different times to take them to the hospital or however many times you offered to take them. Make sure that you document that they had um, X amount of chances to be able to change their mind and be transported for care. All right, DNRs or do not resuscitate orders and pulsed or physician orders for life-sustaining treatment. Um, either one is acceptable, then we call them both um, by their names. This is a legal document that expresses a patient's wishes uh, if a patient's unable to speak for themselves. Uh, so this is a written documentation that they laid out prior to the call when they were still of sound mind or not very sick or injured. Um, and these take effect in these cases, like we discussed, when they're unable to speak for themselves. So DNR or do not resuscitate order, um, it could be part of an advanced directive. Um, you know, should I become unconscious, I want you to do this, or I don't want you to do that. And they also may be part of a pulse or a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. So you need to be familiar with living wills and healthcare proxies um, as they relate to these things um, as well. Let's talk about negligence. Negligence is something that should have been done and it was not done, or it was done incorrectly. So in order to prove this, um, the uh, uh, person filing the charge and the courts have to find that the EMT had a duty to act. Uh, furthermore, they need to find that there was a breach of duty, so the EMT failed to provide a standard of care expected or failed to act altogether. Remember we talked about the standard of care before, being the same type of patient would expect to receive the same type of care as any other patient for whatever they're experiencing that particular day. They also must prove proximate causation, which means that the patient suffered harm because of the EMT's action or inaction. Negligent EMTs may also be required to pay damages. Negligence, we're talking about res ipsa, Locator, the thing that speaks for itself. This is a legal concept important in the negligent cases. So let's talk about duty to act. Duty to act is the obligation that requires patient care on the part of the EMT. Uh, sometimes good Samaritan laws protect well-intended providers when no duty to act exists. So duty to act says that you have an obligation to provide care to a patient. Um, however, duty to act is not always clear. Um, are you off duty? Do you have a duty to act? Are you on duty but you're out of your jurisdiction? Okay. Should you stop and help? Do you have to stop and help? Um, in reference to this, we need to follow our local laws and protocols and follow your own conscience. Just because you don't have a duty to act doesn't mean that you shouldn't help. Um, so be careful about that too. Uh, just to be clear though, Illinois is not a duty to act state. So if you are off duty, um, and you're an EMT or paramedic or whatever else, you are not obligated by law to help. 
Okay, but that doesn't mean that you may not be obligated by your own conscience to help. Um, so you need to think about those things and follow your local laws and protocols. Also in the duty to act section is abandonment. So once care is initiated, it may not be discontinued until transferred to medical personnel of equal or greater training. Failure to do so may constitute abandonment. Uh, so for instance, um, if you're an EMT or even let's go down one level and you're a first responder, once you've started initial care and treatment for your patient, you cannot stop until somebody of higher level comes on scene and relieves you of that. So an EMT could relieve you of that, or a paramedic could relieve you of that, but nobody else, another first responder could help you. Um, but you cannot, you guys as a first responder would not be able to leave that patient. The Good Samaritan laws, these grant immunity from liability if the rescuer acts in good faith within the level of their training. Um, usually it does not apply to on-duty personnel because you're acting uh, in a duty to act situation. And also you have specialized equipment may not cover EMTs in some situations, and it does not protect persons from gross negligence or violations of the law. So if you do something that you know you're not supposed to do, um, or you violate a law while you're performing care for somebody, you will not fall under the Good Samaritan laws. Uh, typically, this also does not um, kick in when you have, um, let's say, some advanced equipment, so to speak. So if you're going to a CPR situation and you happen to have your own medical bag with you and you insert a King Airway and uh, something goes wrong with the insertion of the King Airway, a lot of times it doesn't cover that because it's a specialized skill that you had to have training on. Whereas if you just show up and do CPR on a patient and you're doing uh, mouth to mask ventilations and CPR on them and something were to happen, uh, more than likely you would be covered in that instance because you're not really using specialized equipment. You're just using your training and knowledge uh, to try to save and help this patient. So let's think about this. You arrive on scene of a patient in cardiac arrest. Family says that she has a DNR but doesn't know where it is. How do you think you should handle this? You're off duty and arrive on the scene of a vehicle crash. Police and EMS have not yet arrived are you legally obligated to stop and render aid? So think about these things. The DNR question is a little bit more more uh, difficult to think about. Um, if So I'll kind of discuss it with you and, and we can discuss it in class further if you've got uh, other questions. But if a patient has a DNR and the family can't find it, it basically doesn't exist. Uh, you would continue care as if they do not have a DNR and if they are able to produce that DNR to you while you're still uh, on scene or wherever you guys are at, um, then you would need to call medical control and talk to medical control about cease effort orders. Remember that in Illinois we are not a duty to act state, so you are not legally obligated to stop and render aid. However, you may want to, and you can do so, that's up to you, uh, but you're not legally obligated to do so. Confidentiality. This is information on patient's history, their condition, treatment, um, and all of this is considered confidentials. The big law that uh, takes effect that really ties us up with this is the uh, Privacy Rule of Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA for short. So information shared with other healthcare personnel as, a as part of a patient's continuing care. If it's not part of that, it must be obtained through a subpoena. So all these things are, uh, you know, the ambulance can have patient information because it's part of the continuing of care. That information can be passed on to nurses and doctors that are in the continuing portion of their care. Um, this can also be shared with insurance companies to be able to bill. Um, but otherwise, outside of that, for the most part, if anybody wants access to that information, they're going to have to get a subpoena in order to be able to obtain it. Medical identification devices, there's lots of them out there now. Um, they come in bracelets, necklace. Take a look at your patients. Um, see if uh, they're unconscious or whatever else. If they, you know, do a quick scan, see if they've got a medic alert bracelet on their uh, ankle, their wrist, a necklace of some sort. A lot of this information, too, now is available on cell phones. Uh, a lot of people's home screens have an emergency contact information uh, section or emergency medical information where it'll tell them their blood type, their allergies, and things like that. So you may take a look at their cell phone if it's easily accessible as well. So let's talk about some special situations as we talk about medical, legal, and ethical issues. 
Uh, medical identification devices, we talked about this a lot of times, they're necklaces, bracelets, um, a card on their fridge. You hear things like a vial of life that's stored in their fridge or uh, things on the side of the fridge that uh, may give information about their health history, their allergies, things like that, what medications they take. People wear these uh, medical identification devices and have these vials of life or things on the fridge for uh, known heart conditions, allergies, um, could be allergic to insects, could be allergic to foods um, that cause severe allergic reactions. Diabetic patients often have these and epileptic patients or people that have uh, seizures often have these. Organ donors. Uh, so before you can become an organ donor, you have to complete legal documents allowing donation of the organs and, tish organs and tissues in the event of a death. Um, so this may be identified by family members. They may tell you that they're an organ donor. They may have an organ donor card um, on their person or in their wallet or purse. And a lot of times states put it on their driver's license, so you can typically find that information there as well. Uh, make sure that if you are taking an uh, otherwise deceased patient um, to the hospital, and they're an organ donor, you need to make sure that medical direction and the ER knows um, that they're organ donors so that they, uh, they know we're not just transporting and doing CPR in a patient that uh, has no chance of survival. The safe haven laws, this allows a person to drop off an infant or a child uh, at any fire station, police station, or EMS station. Uh, there, there are rules to this. Uh, you can't drop off just anybody at any age. Um, states have different guidelines for the ages of children that uh, are included in this safe haven law. Uh, but what it does is it protects children who may otherwise be abandoned uh, or harmed by their parents who are unwilling or unable to keep and care for them. Crime scenes. This is a location where crime was committed or anywhere evidence may be found along the way. Uh, once police have made the scene safe, the EMT's priorities is patient care. Um, but do your best to preserve the evidence and identify what what things are actually evidence. Um, if you don't need to walk through a big puddle of blood to get to your patient, then walk around it. You know, if you don't need to move a coffee table to get to your patient, leave it where it's at because that may be evidence. Um, however, if you, do, if you do need to do these things, that's fine. Um, but show caution when you do it. You know, be respectful and also inform law enforcement, hey, in order to be able to get to the patient, I had to move the coffee table and this is where I moved the coffee table to so that they know that we moved it and the potential suspect is not the one that rearranged the whole living room. Some examples of evidence are going to be the condition of the scene, okay, the patient themselves, especially for uh, abuse or uh, you know homicide, suicide, anything like that. You know, Are there any visible sh um, gunshot wounds, any stab wounds, um, uh, indications of a hanging, strangling, struggle, anything like that? Any finger fingerprints and footprints um, are going to be examples of evidence and other microscopic things, things that are going to be found on their, their clothes, um, their skin, uh, anything on the ground. Um, you know, they're going to have a, an investigation team come in and uh, try to reconstruct the scene. Like I talked about earlier, preserve the evidence. Remember what you touch. Remember what you move if you did. Um, minimize your impact on the scene. Don't go places you don't need to. Don't touch things you don't need to. Don't move things you don't need to. Um, and work very closely with the police. Most EMS, fire, and police agencies work very close together. It's not usually a problem. Um, but make sure that you're uh, keeping those lines of communication open and communicating what you've done. Some other special reporting requirements. We are mandated reporters to report child, elderly, or domestic abuse to law enforcement. Uh, any sort of violence, gunshot wounds, or stabbings, uh, even if it's unintentional. You know, somebody had a, a gun range in their backyard, they had an accidental discharge, and it went in their foot. Okay, we don't know for sure that they didn't purposely shoot themselves in the foot, or we don't know that somebody else shot them and they're trying to cover up for it. Uh, so any act of violence, we need to report. Sexual assault, we need to report to law enforcement as well, and also any situation where uh, res restraint may be necessary. Intoxicated persons with injuries, we also need to report that. Mentally incompetent people with injuries, uh, make sure that uh, it wasn't something that they either did themselves or somebody else did to them uh, because they may not be able to stand up for themselves and report it themselves. Um, anything else, there might be some uh, local laws and protocols that you may have to follow report regarding special reporting requirements in your area. So let's recap the chapter real quick on medical, legal, and ethical issues. 
They're part of every EMS call. No matter what you do, we've got legal documents. The patient care reports are legal documents. If they sign a refusal, that's going to be a legal document. So you want to make sure that we are on the up and up with everything um, on every call that we're doing. Remember that consent may be expressed or implied. So if a patient who's awake and oriented has the capacity to fully understand a situation, they refuse care or transport, you remember that you need to make every effort to persuade him, but you cannot force him to accept care or go to the hospital. Negligence is failing to act properly when you have a duty to act. As an EMT, you have a duty to act whenever you're dispatched to a call, so remember that. You may have a legal or moral duty to act even when you're off duty or outside your jurisdiction. So remember in Illinois, we are not a duty to act state if you are off duty. Um, but again, you may have a moral duty to act um, according to your conscience to be able to assist and render aid. Abandonment is leaving a patient after you've initiated care and before you've transferred the patient to a person with a higher, equal or higher training. Uh, so remember too at the hospital when you drop them off, you can't just drop them off and go. You have to turn over that care and give a patient report to somebody with higher care, a higher level of care than you. Typically that's going to be a nurse or a doctor. Confidentiality is the obligation to not reveal personal information you obtain about a patient except to other healthcare professionals that are going to be involved in the patient's care. However, under a court order or a subpoena uh, when the patient signs a release form. Remember that as an EMT, you may be sued or held li legally liable on any of these issues. However, EMTs are rarely held liable when they've acted within their scope of practice and according to the standard of care and have carefully documented all the details of the call. Remember at a crime scene, our first priority is to take care of the patient, and this takes precedence over any preservation of evidence. However, we should do our best to make every effort uh, to not disturb the scene unnecessarily and if we do so, we need to make sure that we're reporting our actions and observations to the police. This also goes to, sh to say that if you notice something that the police may not have yet, you need to do your due diligence and report that on as well. Remember, as EMTs, we need to make sure that we're using good judgment and good decision-making skills when we're dealing with patients, especially as it relates to consent and refusals. Remember that avoiding negligence implies using good judgment. Critical thinking is an essential component for avoiding liability. Remember that we as EMTs hold responsibility for patients' protected health information, so we need to make sure that we're exercising care when dealing with this information is a legal and ethical obligation. Some questions to consider. Define scope of practice. Define negligence. Define duty to act define abandonment, and define confidentiality. What steps must you take when a patient refuses care or transportation? What types of evidence may be found at a crime scene, and how should you act to preserve the evidence? And lastly, let's think about some things critically here. You respond to a motor vehicle crash and find a seriously injured patient. He has no pulse, and you're about to begin CPR when someone says, don't do that, he's got cancer, and he has a DNR. No one has the DNR at the scene, so what do you do? Do you start CPR and transport the patient? Review these questions, review your text, and be prepared with questions at class. Make sure that uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out, either save them for class or reach out to me, um, and I will answer and address these questions as they come in. That concludes Chapter 4.